All right, great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. We're going to go inside the Great Boston Fire. So author Stephanie Scarro uh, will discuss her new book, The Great Boston Fire, The Inferno That Nearly Incarcerate, oh, no, Incinerated the City. Oh, boy. Uh, 150 years ago, uh, for two days in November 1872, uh, a massive fire swept through Boston, leaving the downtown in ruins and the population traumatized. Coming bar barely a year after the infamous Chicago fire, Boston's Inferno turned out to be one of the most expensive fires per acre in U.S. history. Yet today, few are aware of how close Boston came to disruption. Boston author Stephanie Scarro will recount the fire's history from the foolish decisions that precipitated it to the heroics of firefighters who fought it. We're going to experience the drama of a life and death battle in the heart of our city. So Stephanie is a veteran journalist who has worked for the Boston Herald, the Associated Press, and other media. Her previous books include Inside the Combat Zone, the stripped down story of Boston's most notorious neighborhood, uh, Drinking Boston, a history of the city and its spirits, Boston on Fire, a history of fires and firefighting in Boston, and the Coconut Grove Fire. So all uh, nearly 200 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Stephanie for joining us tonight. And Stephanie, you can take it away. Thanks so great. much. Wow, thank you, Robert. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for that great introduction. And hi, everyone, I can't see you, but I know you're out there. So I'm really happy to be there, to be here and to talk to you about this fire. So what I'm gonna do now, give me a second, I'm gonna share my screen and get this thing rolling, if we can, and we'll start out talking about our fire. So first of all, um, this is the book I'm gonna be talking about tonight. And it's one of, uh, you mentioned a number of my books. Uh, I do write books for, about Boston history. I, it's kind of an addiction of mine. And um, as you notice, they're kind of unusual topics about crimes and fires and drinking in the comment zone, but that's what I like to write. I like to write people's histories of this area. And I have been fascinated by this fire for a very long time. Now, why did I become fascinated with this fire that happened almost 150 years ago in November of 1872? And I'll be quite honest, it was what got to me was the sheer scale of it. And what I'm showing you right now are some panoramic uh, photographs of the destruction of Boston after the fire. And this is of the downtown section. For those of you who know the downtown area where, where um, Jordan March and Phy Filene's used to be and um, where the, uh, the Trinity Church in that downtown area, this is what it looked like in 1872 after the fire. And the scale of it just amazed me. And I would walk around downtown the crossing area and just imagine what it'd be like to have all this gone, disappeared instantly. And you think of Hiroshima, you think of uh, Dresden, you think of other things. And today you think of Ukraine. I hate to say it, bring that up, but you look at that destruction. And I think that has an effect on people. And this fire certainly had effect on the psyche of the city at the time, although um, there's some caveats to that. So, there are also lessons for, of this fire for today. It isn't just something that happened in the past and we can forget about it. It has meaning for us today. And I'm gonna be talking about some of those lessons. So just to put things in context, Boston, as one author said, was built to burn. There's been a number of major fires in this, in this city, in this area and around this area over the years. And the great Boston fire was one of a number of them. It's not as bad in terms of loss of life as the Coconut Grove nightclub fire uh, of, of 1942, uh, but it um, fits in with a number of these other conflagrations that happened around this area. Now, to put this a little bit in context, in the 19th century, American cities were just burning up left and right. It was a true problem, social problem, that there were many, many fires in these urban areas, partly because of the building, um, the rapid building of the country at that time. In fact, today I would compare it to the wildfires that we're seeing in the, in the wildland area in places like California or the West, where the fires are getting out of control. And that was what was happening 
<clears throat> in the cities around the US. The most famous one was, of course, the 1871 Chicago fire. And we all know about that fire because we had that really catchy lyric about Mrs. O'Leary's cow, right? So it was one of many, but that could not happen in Boston now, could it? Or could it? So thinking about where Boston was at this time, the hub was a city of about 250,000 people. It was a busy port city. It um, was a center for commerce, and capitalism. It guarded its position as the Athens of America with the intellectual capital in the city uh, very jealously. And there were reformers that range from cause that supported causes range from temperance to women's suffrage to animal welfare, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But um, it was also an area of uh, intense uh, growth at this time. The downtown area was once a neighborhood of gracious homes, but now it become a center for business. And so new warehouses, new retail stores, um, we're all lining up these areas. And you can see from this picture, they were just cramming into that this area of the city, chop, block after block of these, of these very tall, and at the time they were considered very tall buildings that were built kind of like temples to commerce. Um, they often had flourishes like something called a mansard roof, which was a wooden uh, configuration on top of the building. Um, and they were made of uh, brick and iron and they had granite facing and they were it was a very the city was extraordinarily proud of its downtown because they felt it was just a symbol of the growing prosperity and power of boston but there were a lot of problems the city was however extremely proud of its fire department boston at that time had what was considered one of the best uh fire uh, departments in the entire country. The men were well, the men, and they're all men at this time, were well trained. They had up to date equipment, which included steam fire engines, like the one picture here, which could, when plugged into a hydrant and to, or to a water source, could be, would burn coal or some of the fuel, create pressure, and create huge streams that could be put onto fires to fight them from the top down, which is a very effective way to fight it. And the department was run by a man I'm gonna talk about in just a minute, but there were some flaws in this great particular fire system. For example, that downtown area, which I'm showing you here, as I said, had changed from a neighborhood of houses to intense business. And therefore the infrastructure, the water mains were built, were still those built for houses, not for large, huge building complexes. So there were problems there. There were also not enough fire stations in that area. There are fire stations all over the city, but in this area, which was considered very vulnerable, there were not as many as probably were needed. I mentioned those flammable, those mansard roofs were considered very flammable and a safety hazard. And there was a problem with the alarm system, the fire alarm system that I'll talk about in just a sec. But the, the department was blessed with a particularly good leader, John S. Demro. He was called the chief engineer of the department. He used to call them chief engineers. And he was very forward thinking. He was a builder himself. He came from a background in the building trades. He had been a volunteer firefighter and he was elected, and this was an elected official to be head of the fire department. And he really took the job incredibly seriously. He pushed and pushed for developments that would help the city. And he was very worried about that downtown area, particularly those water mains were just not big enough to get enough water into, the air, into that area. So if there was a problem, they, he could not put out the fires that well. But like so many other cases, his warnings went unheeded. He, in, over and over again in his annual reports, he would point out the weaknesses. He would point out the things that needed to be done, the lack of apparatus, the fire hydrants. But he soon found out the city just didn't want to hear it. They felt that he wasn't hired to push for his fire department, that he was only trying to enlarge his kind of kingdom. And in fact, 
he, there was this very famous quote when he mentioned there was a real problem with the system, he was told, do not try to magnify the wants of your department or your office so much. In 1871, after the Chicago fire, Damerel actually went to that city, went there by train to see firsthand what went on there. And what he saw chilled him. He could see how this fire was spread. He could see how it was fought. And he knew that it could happen in Boston. And so when he returned, he again approached the city council to say, we need to get rid of those mansard roofs. We need a better system. We need more fire stations. We need a fireboat. Well, he got the fireboat. That's one thing he got. It, didn't, it went into business, went into commission about a month after the Great Fire. But for the most part, the people in the city just didn't believe it could happen here in Boston. There's one other aspect of this whole fire. And that is, and this is another reason why I wanted to write the book, because I was just fascinated with this thing. But right before the fire, there was an, what they call an epizootic, a pandemic, but for horses. Now, now picture where we are in this time. Everything was horsepower, except for trains. Trolleys, uh, wagons, freight was all dragged by horses. People, the, the city ran on its horsepower. But then starting in October, horses started to fall sick. They got a, a flu or something. They started to get very sick and the flu began to spread, spread around the country. It started in Canada and it spread through New England. It spread west, it hit California and even spread into Mexico and then back up into Canada. Nobody knew what this was. Now, remember, they didn't have germ theory at this time. They didn't know what a virus was. They'd never heard of a virus. So they couldn't figure out what was causing all these horses to get sick and to get very, very suddenly. Um, and what was interesting about this was that it was later discovered that the, that the flu was being spread by the railroad. That was because horses were transported by the railroad. So you can track the spread of this problem by looking at the railroads. I talked at length to a researcher who really looked into this, who, who thought, it was, and he told me a very interesting fact that he looked at all the newspapers about this horse plague, as they said, and they would say things like, well, it's happening over there, it's happening in New York, it's ha but it isn't here yet. And then a few days later, it would be there. So it was again, this feeling of, well, it can happen here, but then it does. And again, people weren't aware exactly how it spread. Well, we know today, obviously it was spread from horse to horse, um, but there was not a sense of how that would, could happen in those days. And here are some pictures. This was very well documented at the time. Um, here's a kind of a heartrending picture of, of, some, of, of a man and his, and his horse, which was his livelihood. Now I should note, that the, it didn't kill the horses necessarily. The horses get very, very sick. They couldn't work, but they didn't all die. In fact, only a minority of the horses died. They did get better sooner or later, but it took a while. And in the meantime, what happened? Well, they had to substitute manpower for horsepower. So all around the city, in fact, like all around the country, men were, and, and women to some extent, but were, were pushing around and doing all the tasks that used to be done by horses. And there was even quite a move to, uh, by animal welfare people to push for better treatment for horses at this time. And this, this illustration from Harper's Weekly uh, illustrates that. You're gonna see a lot of pictures from uh, Harper's Weekly um, and from other newspapers of the day. And a lot of those are actually in my book because I like to tell stories with images. So this is an example of, uh, I believe this might actually have been done by the famous cartoonist Thomas Nast. His name isn't here, but it looks like his style. But um, many people use this opportunity to push for better treatment for horses. But this pose, this horse sickness, posed a really major, major problem for the fire department because these fire engines were pulled by horses. Previous, previous iterations of fire engines were pulled by men, by hand, but they become so big and um, more effective, but they're bigger and heavier, they had to be pulled by horses. And when the horses were sick, 
they had no way to pull them. And even if they could get fresh horses, these horses that pulled fire engines were very specially trained. Trained. They were trained to be calm uh, in a fire. They were trained to, when they heard a bell, to go right into their stall where a halter would drop down and they get out of their out of their station very quickly. So they were very, very specially trained horses that the, the firemen were actually very affectionate toward because um, they did so much work. They're really part of the department, but now they were sick. So Damrell, Chief Damrell, was really worried. How are we going to cover this? If a big fire breaks out, what are we going to do? So he got all these men together and they came up with a plan. First of all, the fire engines would be pulled by men. Um, so they'd go back to the thing and they'd bring in more volunteers to help with that. They would reduce the number of engines that would respond to the alarm system. Boston at the time had a, had, a, had a kind of alarm system where with the first alarm, it would bring out a certain amount of apparatus from a specific area and other fire engines would come kind of move in to cover what was left uncovered. A uh, second alarm would call in even more people Third alarm, even more, and fourth alarm, everybody would respond to a fire in an area. So Daryl said, okay, we, we can't send everyone else out at the same time. We've got to conserve our energy. So we, we'll set up a system. So we'll cover the, cover the city uh, with, with manpower and we'll do the best we can. And for a while, it seemed to be working. Now, let's get up to the, to the um, evening of, uh, of November 9th. And I'm often asked what caused the fire, this big fire. And I have to tell you, that's not the question because what it could have been anything. And in this case, it, it looked like it was a problem in one building in the base when a, when a spark kind of escaped from the furnace. But that's not what caused, the, 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 that was what caused the fire. But the reason this fire became a disaster was it was a systems failure. It was a systems failure throughout the safety and infrastructure of the area. Uh, and no, it wasn't a cow kicking off a, over a bucket either. So what happened that day? About 7 p.m. on Saturday, November 9th, fire was seen in this building. We have a picture of it at Kingston and Summer Streets in the downtown area of Boston. It was about seven o'clock, it was dark. Uh, it was a Tebbets, Baldwin and Davis building. It was filled to the brim with, it was a retail and retail, retail and wholesale operation, had a lot of clothes, had some factories, businesses right in there. It was packed with material for the holidays which were coming up. So somebody saw fire in this building about seven o'clock but the alarm wasn't given off for a while. Some people watched it burn and they didn't actually go to the alarm and pull it to let, up, to let, um, let the fire department know that what was going on. Now at the time I said pull, but actually it was actually fire alarms at this point were cranked. But the problem with the fire alarm system was that they were very worried about false alarms. So all the fire boxes like this one all over the city were kept locked. So even though people started to say, hey, there's a fire here and start to yell about fire, it took a while to find someone, in this case, a police officer, to open the box, crank it, and send the alarm to, to the fire headquarters, which alerted the city where the fire was. Now, it was from box 52. And the way that worked was that the church bells of the city would ring out the location of the box. So in this case, They'd ring out five rings and then two, 52, five and two. And this started to alert fire, the different companies to come to this place where the fire was burning. And they came fairly quickly, but by then the fire was really going. The first alarm, if the fire started about seven, the first alarm wasn't sent out until seven, 724. So it got a head start. Now, Damrell himself, the chief engineer, heard the bells, he heard the 52, he knew exactly where that was. He lived on Beacon Hill, he ran to the location uh, on Summer Street and immediately saw he had a major horrible fire in his hand. His firefighters were already there, but the building before him was like an inferno. He'd never seen anything like that. He, it was like looking into the maw of hell and he could see it was spreading. 
And he could already almost immediately see he was having problems because as this illustrated, the streams from the fire engines weren't reaching to the tops of these buildings and was the firefighters were having difficulty in trying to control it. And so slowly but inexorably, the fire began to spread. The fire spread in some cases from roof to roof because of those mansard roofs that were wooden and caught fire. So a lot of these buildings started to burn from the top down and that's very hard to fight. And very soon the fire spread block to block. And even though more firefighters came out and the fact the entire, um, the entire fighting force of the city came to the downtown area and Jamrell also set for help from fire um, companies all around the area. So people from outside, from Malden, from Medford, from, uh, from Peabody, I'm not sure about Tewksbury, not even, came to the fire to help the Boston firefighters. But the fire just kept on spreading. Now we don't have, I'm gonna say something here, we don't have any pictures of the fire burning itself, but we have lots of illustrations. And that's because the media at that time was very keen on getting illustrations. So I'm gonna be showing you a lot of illustrations of this fire, which was called the fire fiend by the newspapers. Here's a, how, look, now um, let me point, point out a couple of things. First, you'll notice how the streams are not hitting, going anywhere near the tops of the building. That was a problem. And you'll also notice the throngs and throngs of people in the street. People like to watch fires in the stores those days. So all of Boston came out to watch this fire and because it was entertainment. Other people came because their businesses were in this area and they said, oh, I've got to rescue as much as I can. So they were out there trying to rescue important papers, trying to rescue as much material as they could from the area. And a lot of, a lot of merchants realized very soon they couldn't get their stuff out of the way fast enough so they started giving it away. So there was a mad throng of people grabbing stuff, some legitimately, some just looting. And meanwhile, the firefighters are trying to get through the crowds and trying to fight this fire, which is continuing to spread. This is a map created by a friend of mine, my friend, Bruce Twinkler, who wrote, did an amazing documentary on the fire called Damrell's Fire. And if you can ever get it, um, uh, it's often plays on PBS. It's an amazing reproduction of that fire. But you can see the fire started in this particular area here at Summer, near Summer Street in Kingston and then spread and spread. And what happened is that the firefighters would set up their defenses, but would run out of water or be overwhelmed. In fact, at one point right along Frank, Franklin Street here, uh, Jamal was pretty sure he could contain it, but they ran out of water. And that was due to the mains that were too small. There was just not enough water in that area. So the fire just continued to spread. Now it's, whoops, right back. It spread to the wharfs, burn the wharfs, uh, but the ocean stopped it. If there hadn't been an ocean there, would hit England. But unfortunately there did, but it continued to spread throughout <clears throat> that night and all through the next day. Um, <clears throat> here's another look at the area. This is a modern map and the streets have, have all kind of been changed and you have, you don't have the, the harbor, right? You don't have the harbor right here like you used to. This is generally where the fire took place. Here's a great view of it uh, from the water. And you can see that it was a spectacular. It could be seen from about 40 miles offshore. And the, the, the difficulty the firefighters had with this is that the fire got so hot and got big, it would literally jump from building to building, would jump across streets, and it created its own wind. So it was almost, as they said, a hurricane of fire that was spreading through the city. Franklin Street, I think I showed you a picture of that earlier, how beautiful it was, and now it was completely in flames. And we had so many people trying desperately to get their material out of the way. And plenty of looters, the militia was called out and Damro really had his hands full. So he did the best he could. He tried to marshal his men in the most strategic place. When companies came in from other areas, he tried to put them in um, good locations. 
Um, there were there was um, a controversy over what we would uh, the use of dynamite to blow up buildings to create firebox. And at one point, Daryl's he was being besieged by people, save our city, save our city. And a lot of people were volunteering to go blow up buildings to create these blocks. And at one point he said, okay, go do it. And then it turned out that blowing up to create fire blocks so that fire won't jump over it didn't do really much good for another problem with the infrastructure. And that was the city at the time was lit by gas lights and the gas mains could not be turned off street by street. They could only be turned, the gas mains could only be turned off at the main location. So when a building got exploded, the gas would continue to uh, come out of the pipes, would pool and eventually explode. So the city was just filled with explosions and the terrible, terrible sounds of granite falling. And that's the other thing about it. A lot of these buildings were built of granite. Well, guess what? Granite has pockets of water in it. When the water got heated up, it would literally explode. So you had buildings, granite buildings, exploding throughout the city, which of course helped to spread the fire. The bravery of these firefighters, armed with only of this 19th century technology, was amazing. Um, this is uh, from Harper's. It was on the cover of Harper's Weekly. It is a bit romanticized, I'm sure, but seriously, these guys exhibited enormous bravery in terms of trying to fight this overwhelming uh, hurricane, often having to run out of water, having to move back, having to set up again, um, trying to rescue people from exploding from buildings that fall, fell down. So it was a truly amazing job by the firefighters. Another thing I discovered in the course of my research that a lot of Bostonians came down to watch this fire, including some people you've heard about. Louisa May Alcott, William Lloyd Garrison, the famous abolitionist, and Alexander Graham Bell. And yes, they all seem to have three names in those days. I don't know why, but Louisa May Alcott, who's one of my favorite authors, um, was was just went out to watch the fire, went out, came back, um, and actually wrote a short, short story about what she saw there. But she was gung-ho to, to escape. At one point, she, she lived on Beacon Hill at the time. And at one point, they thought they would have to evacuate. So she got her best boots. She threw the manuscript of the book she was writing into her satchel was all ready to, to leave. But fortunately, she didn't have to do that. William Lloyd Garrison, who was not only an abolitionist, issue, but was considered radical back then or today, we'd consider him um, really far, far seeing and really in the mainstream of where we should have been at that time. There's a secret about him. He was actually a spark. William Lloyd Garrison liked to run out to fires and see fires. And there's some references in his letters about waking up a son and going out to look at the fire. And he went out and was looking at the Great Boston Fire and he had some interesting um, speculation about that. Um, Alexander Graham Bell, who would, who would go on to invent the telephone, ran out and like everyone else was trying to help out, participating in all that and wrote up, an, um, wrote up a full account of it, of his experience of it, sent it to the Globe, expecting it to be published and it never was. And as far as I know, we've never found a copy of it, which is a real shame because I really would have liked to hear what he had to say. Um, as I said, um, as the day wore on, as we started to get from Saturday into Sunday, a lot of um, uh, uh, fire engines from outside the area came in. A lot of them were pulled by men because of the horse problem, many, many miles to get there. From New Hampshire, Maine, um, Connecticut, um, fire engines came by train. So the men would literally load up the fire engines onto trains and bring them into the city. And that proved to be helpful in this particular incident. Um, at, um, it, towards the morning of Sunday, the fire was raging and it was getting very near the Old South Church or the Old South Meeting House, we call it today, one of the oldest and most historic buildings in Boston. And people believed that, the, the, that that building would be lost. And as you can see from this illustration, there were men up the, on the roof trying to bat out sparks. There were people trying to keep it wet. And at the nick of time, a company from New Hampshire, from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, brought in their 
fire engine that they called the Kirsarge, so the fire engines often had names. And then the Kirsarge was able to bring sort of fresh, powerful streams, fresh men, and help to save the Old South. Um, a little, that might be a little bit mythical, but indeed the Kirsarge did come to, to Boston and did play a major role in the fire and the Old South was indeed saved. So what eventually Damerel was able to do was to mass his forces at key points just along this edge of the city. And by then he had enough, enough men, enough engines, and he was able to get water and he able to hold it back at these points, hold it along Washington Street, um, hold it up in this area here. Uh, the fire got under control by Sunday. Another fire broke related to a broke out on Monday, uh, which was actually not actually caused a lot of damage that was down in this area. But eventually by Monday morning, the fire was steamed out and Boston was faced with looking at a devastated city. Ultimately, about 776 buildings were destroyed, about 60 acres, um, millions in damage. In fact, I would even say a billion, billions of dollars in damage. I think I made this estimate some years ago, and I would say it was well over a billion. Um, about 11 to 12 firefighters were killed. It's a little unclear um, if this one gentleman, John Richardson of New Haven, actually died or not. Um, but um, we, and we know their names. We know the names of the men who died uh, from the fire department. And you can see they're from Boston, Charlestown, Cambridge, Worcester. Um, what we don't really have on this fire is the number of people killed totally. But the good news on that, it was not that high. It was definitely not like the Chicago fire, which took out several hundred people. I would estimate maybe 20 to 30, only 20 to 30 people died on this fire. And that was because it was not in a residential area and people were able to get out and the firefighters helped to get people out of, of burning areas. So uh, it didn't spread, it, it did not spread so fast that people couldn't get themselves out of the way even if they couldn't rescue their material. The country, this is headlines all around the country. This is a illustration by the, the famous cartoonist Thomas Nast about people mourning um, there. Uh, and then something else happened right after the fire and that was photographers. Photographers rushed into this area to get pictures, to chronicle it. Like I said, they don't have pictures of the fire itself because that was too difficult for the technology today, but they could get great pictures of the aftermath of the fire. And you can look at some of these pictures which are at the uh, part of the uh, Boston Public Library collection. So here's some. And some of these photos were just, they're, they're horribly beautiful. Um, this is by uh, a Jay Black, one of the famous photographers of the day. It's another picture by him. And just, they really capture that sense of the destruction after the fire. And these photos appeared, so to speak, in, in media around the world. That is, at the time, media, uh, the newspapers could not reproduce photos, but they could get illustrators to create illustrations from the photos and then print them. And this is an example of how a, a photograph was turned into an illustration for the paper. Um, the photographers also really, really tried to get panoramic. They really wanted to get the sense of the scale of the disaster. Um, this is a panorama by, by the photographer Black, which I mentioned. It was turned into an illustration, but he, but he made prints of it and in fact, William Lloyd Garrison spoke proudly of getting gifted a photo, this photo, this photograph. And he talked about how great it was and he would treasure it forever. But there was another reason the photographers were rushing in to the city to take pictures. And that had to do with the custom at the time of stereographic cards. And you may, you may have seen this from your, from your youth with those little view masters that you had, you put the slides and it gives you a nice 3D effect. Well, this was something very popular at the time. And so uh, photographers used these images to create these stereographic images like this and this and this. There are, they created hundreds, if not thousands of these images. And these are all ones I, I found on eBay. And there's still a lot now. 
uh, around now. And just, I don't know if I'm gonna hold this up, but this is what they would view them in. So you would take, you would take your slide, put it here, and then look at it through that, the view master here, and you get a 3D image. And this was a very popular pastime in Victorian uh, era. And usually there are landscapes of beautiful places and, and flowers and things like that, but they also loved pictures of disaster. And you might say, wow, that's pretty weird. And I would say, just go to the movies today. And most movies just revel in blowing things up. The bigger, the better. So there was this kind of, there was kind of a sense of destruction of entertainment that was manifest by these particular, by these particular things here. Um, people also sold their, uh, relics from the fire. And in fact, um, I was at the Bear Cove Fire Museum and they had this um, box full of material that was supposedly from the fire, which I thought was very interesting of material that was saved afterwards, including these letters, which is kind of, a, kind of eerie to look at them and think that these survived the fire. Now the businesses of Boston got to work. And even if their entire businesses were destroyed, they tried to tell people, well, we're setting up somewhere else and we're gonna keep going. So they put signs of their businesses in this destructive area, in the, in the area that was destroyed and they keep going. And they would um, try to get back as quickly as they could. And a lot of them, went into, this, into these areas and tried to retrieve whatever they could, including safes. And a lot of them were <clears throat> very pleasantly surprised to find even in the middle of all the destruction, a lot of their safes with, with important paper and money and all that did survive. So this is some example of this. Um, I mean, it was interesting that they rushed in to um, set up businesses and people rushed in. There was kind of like we call disaster tourism and hundreds of people came to view the ruins. It was, it was a quite, Quite interesting at that time. Um, and of course, the media jumps in. This, this particular magazine, this was published like just uh, just days. It was The embers were barely cool when they came up with this booklet about the fire with this supposedly great story. And in the back, there's an ad for safes. So, <laughs> you know, never turn down an opportunity to promote yourself. If your safe survived the Great Boston Fire, by God, it's a great safe. And, Here's the testimony to prove it. So those were on sale. So here's the thing. Boston rebuilt quickly, very quickly. They um, were, many of the merchants were covered by insurance, not all. And some people were ruined, but a number of people were able to pick themselves up and keep going. Um, and as I said, there was not a large loss of life. So it was a matter of rebuilding. And indeed the city was rebuilt remarkably quickly uh, in, it took about two or three years and all that destruction disappeared and they were able to redo it. So um, that was something that was interesting for me to read was that how quickly they were able to rebuild. Now that did not mean they didn't try to figure out what went wrong and a commission, because this is Boston, we like commissions. So they, they commissioned a commission, this is a book of all the testimony is testimony about what happened. And you know who they largely based for the fire, for this fire was Chief John Damrell. Even though he warned about it, even though he had tried his best to stop it, they needed to blame somebody. And so he got a lot of blame. He got a lot of blame for, for being on the front lines and not acting more like a general. He got blamed for his use of uh, for the explosives, even though he tried to stop it. So to a large extent, he was blamed by it. Not by his men. His men, his firefighters were extremely supportive, but in a large part, he was he was scapegoated immediately after the fire for, for the, it was immediately after the fire for the fire. A number of, um, there, in, in the aftermath, um, there was, however, a better uh, attention to building and zoning and creating better and safer fires. Um, they improved the water system. It took a while, but they did re improve it. Um, they tried to straighten out the streets. They didn't, they weren't able to do that because people opposed that. So that's why you still have those crazy streets in the downtown area. And um, and the sad thing is that there were a number of really bad fires even after the Great Fire. And it took a while for that for it to really settle in. 
that wasn't a once in a lifetime thing. We really have to make sure that we protect ourselves against this all this time. Now, Damrell is interesting because um, he resigned as the chief engineer in 1873. They reorganized the department and he felt, uh, I'm out of here. <clears throat> but he was able to found something that became known as the International Association of Fire Chiefs, which continues today, which has had a lot of impact around the nation of preventing these fires in urban centers uh, around the United States. So he played a real major role in that. And he could have left, he could have just slunk off, took his licks, but no, he took on the role of the chief of the city department of building inspection, really the first building inspector in 1870, 77. And he may continue to make push to improve the, um, codes in the building in the city, because the best fire is the fire that never happens, that you don't know about, because it's prevented by the safety precautions in the infrastructure. Um, his son also served, he, he was there for about 25 years. His son served as a building commissioner. He, he retired and he died a few years later. Um, and he's buried here in um, Forest, Forest Hill Cemetery, uh, very near the fireman's lot. Um, and he is considered to be, by today, to be one of the great firefighters um, of the country, really, because of the way he, he really looked forward and looked for ways to prevent fires from even happening. Let me kind of start wrapping up with a really cool little story. You know that, that Curisage, that fire engine? Well, it was, it languished for a long time, but it was finally found and refurbished and it's now back in the Portsmouth uh, Fire Department. And back in 2010, um, the Boston Fire Historical Society brought the Kearsarge back to Boston to commemorate the fire and brought it to the very spot where it stood when it helped to save the Old South. And there's the Old South right there and there's the Kearsarge. Here's another look at it. Um, people love seeing this. It's like a little bit of, you know, uh, what is it, what they call it? punk rock, punk, uh, you know, whatever it is uh, there. Some of the audience will know this. Um, and so it was really great to see this, this machine be saved and be restored. I think it's fully restored now in, in, in Portsmouth. Here's a picture of the Old South today. It did survive. Uh, and we're very lucky that we still have it as a historic marker. And here's box 52. This is a box from the area from which the original signal was sent out about the fire. Um, there was even a, there even is a group, a fire group called the Box 52 Association, which, which looks, which tries to look at fire, fire issues. Uh, the box is, it says 52 on it. It is not actually 52. It's got another number, but it's marked by this little um, uh, lantern, you could say, that really shows that this is very, a uh, very historic spot. So I'd like to finish up my presentation by just reading a short excerpt from the introduction to the book. And this is um, in the beginning where I talk about why I'm writing the book. So let me read this part. The past, as William Faulkner tells us, is never really dead. It's not even past. As I began writing this book, massive bushfires fueled by global warming swept through Australia. In the US, the campfire wiped out the town of Paradise uh, California and brutal forest fires returned the next year. The fire fiend, which is what they call the, the great fire, has not disappeared. It's just taken other forms. And there are modern damerals. Young Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg has endured ridicule to declare that our house, the earth, is on fire and we must rush to the rescue. And then there is the COVID-19 pandemic. In late 2019, and this is just as I was beginning to really get into this book, a Chinese physician, Dr. Lu, Dr. Li Win Lang, attempted to warn Wuhan area hospitals about the spread of a deadly new virus. He was instructed by police to keep his concerns to himself. He later succumbed to COVID-19, among the first of the millions who would die worldwide. And even as the coronavirus began its march around the globe, many denied it was worse than the typical flu or that wearing masks could minimize its spread or that it even existed at all. 
We still refuse to listen to those who warn of possibilities and consequences, the whistleblowers, the Cassandras, the prophets of doom. Don't magnify the situation so much, we say. What do you know anyway? Can't happen here. Lighten up. Boston didn't listen to Don John S. Dermo, a man who tried to tell the city that it faced a monumental disaster and who first bore the brunt of the blame for what happened. He would understand the dilemma of those who warn us of the unimaginable and whom we ignore until a strange light wakes us from sleep and we open the door to a furnace. So now the sales pitch. You can buy my book through online retailers. You can go to your local bookstore, do that, or you can go to the library and get it for free. And, and I believe it, there's copies there and they're also, um, you can order at different places. Um, if you want it signed, come to any of my events. I do have one coming up. Unfortunately, it's in Weymouth, but uh, on Tuesday, April 12th, uh, I'll be over there in person live to talk about this fire. And I'll be having other uh, events um, throughout the year. So if you buy it and you really would like it signed at some point, uh, hopefully we'll be able to um, speak together uh, and meet about this. And I'm going to stop the share now. And I'm going to thank you so much for all your attention to this. And I'd like to break for questions. I'm gonna look into the chat and see if there's any questions there. And I think Robert's gonna help us. So thank you, thank you, thank you for coming to this event. Yeah, no, wonderful job, Stephanie. Uh, folks, let Stephanie know in the chat how much you enjoyed tonight's presentation. And uh, Stephanie, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, which is great. Uh, oh, yeah. So let's take uh, 15 minutes of questions or so. If folks have any questions, uh, please get them into the Q&A and uh, we'll begin. So uh, we already have uh, many questions here. Uh, Mark asks, uh, BU's three founders, uh, Sleeper, Rich, and Clappen, all owned property damaged in the fire, which was supposed to be bequeathed to the university. This was a huge loss uh, for Boston University that slowed its progress until relatively recently. Did you discover anything about this aspect of the fire? Um, I know those names, but I did not find anything about uh, Boston University, but that's really interesting. Uh, Harvard, I, I did find a lot of material about that other little school, Harvard, uh, because um, they had property downtown. And in fact, they, they, um, some of the um, uh, people from Harvard, like the president of the college, I think, came into the city to grab, to get material from their possessions, from the bank. And they literally walked it over with guns, carrying their guns over to Cambridge where they guarded it. Um, so I didn't know that about uh, BU, but that, um, I think if I, I looked a bit of it that, um, uh, I, I would find out something, but indeed there was, there were a lot of um, people who lost a lot of money and universities uh, it had holdings in Boston and that would, um, that definitely had an impact. Uh, Teresa asked if the fire had any sort of impact on the North End. No, not, uh, actually, I don't think so. It didn't reach that far. Uh, I do know that um, fire, fire engines from the North End companies did come from the North End um, to the fire. And in fact, they, they pulled their um, engines there and they actually got there. They only lost a couple couple minutes. So, I mean, one of the myths about this fire is that, oh, the horse pandemic caused it. But it, when you look at the actual time, it did slow down the response. It was hard to get people there, but it was slowed down by about two to three minutes. Now that's a lot in a fire. Believe me, you know things can get out of control very quickly. But so many of the so many of the people literally dragged their engines to the fire, and I believe they dragged them from the north end. I think I remember uh, writing something about that. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, "How did the city get rid of all the debris, like the bricks and stones?" Well, a lot of it was actually used for landfill into the harbor. And um, where what's now um, uh, kind of the, where the, the harbor now ex extends now that the, the land that we don't we don't end we don't end at High Street anymore near the water it extends out. In fact, um, the people at the fire museum uh, uh, down a little farther will say that that building is built on the debris from the fire. So they literally took it threw it in the water and kind of extended the 
the the short front. That that's where a lot of the that's where a lot of the debris went. Uh, Carol asks, did they improve the fireboxes because they were locked and only accessible by policemen at the time of this fire? Yes, that eventually they got rid of this whole idea of having a locked box. So now um, you have a you have the situation you can just pull it. And the interesting thing about the fire alarm system in Boston is that it was one of the first in the nation to have um, a system uh, that was kind of based on the telegraph. And uh, we still retain, the, the fire department still retains a lot of that because that system, um, I'm told, will continue to operate even if electricity goes out because it's kind of on a, a separate kind of grid. So um, the, the, uh, I do write about the invention of the, of the fire telegraph or the fire alarm system in my book, Boston on Fire. And that's another interesting story about how, they, how, they, how that was created. But indeed, eventually they got rid of the, of the, the locks because as you say, a certain amount of false alarms um, was better than not being able to call in a, um, an alarm at all. Uh, Mike asks, uh, was the street layout redrawn after the fire as was done by other cities after great, fri after great fires? Uh, and he notes the illustrations yeah. and photos yeah. made the street look much wider than today. Uh, were they? Um, yeah, not so much. I mean, that's interesting. There was some straightening. And if you can, can compare the, the street configuration of back then with today, it's, it's a little harder to do. I wish I had a better slide for that. I know someone's asking about that. Um, you'll see that it was widened. There was some streets were lengthened, but there wasn't um, a major redoing of the downtown and like other cities did. Uh, and in fact, um, a, a brilliant um, a sort of PhD thesis on this fire uh, by uh, uh, Diane Rudnick mourns this. She wrote it in the 70s. She said, she said um, the point of her thesis was that Boston blew its chance to have a really well-ordered, well um, put together downtown by not um, going through with taking the, the major step of straightening and fixing up the streets there. So it wasn't done as much as it could have been. And, and she felt that that contributed a lot to the doldrums of the, the, the 70s and the 80s in terms of, uh, you know, downtown Boston was really depressed at that time, um, which is why the combat zone emerged, subject of another book of mine. Um, so, uh, but it wasn't as straightened out as much. And there was a lot of controversy about why that was. And there was a lot of pushback from the, from the property owners there. Uh, so folks, last call for questions. We'll take another five to six minutes of questions. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, what was one of your favorite discoveries that you made while researching the Great Boston Fire of 1872? Oh, well, I think I think one of the, I don't know if favorite, but the most interesting was about the horse pandemic or the horse flu, because it, it's mentioned in passing about the horse flu. And I thought, wait a minute, if every single horse in the country, it was almost like every, the majority of the horses got, got sick. What happened? What caused it? What's going on? So I really, really liked looking into that. And as I said, it did not kill the horses. They recovered. And we never had another equine flu like this, in part because we switched from using horses. So we, we still don't know exactly what caused that um, that flu, but it, it was interesting, and I and I think I really liked. Uh, I sort of dove into some of the animal welfare people who wrote a lot about this, the treatment of horses during this time, and um, I was interested to find out that um, you know Angel Memorial, the vet veterinary hospital, there was an a, a Mr. Angel who was very active this time and who was very much involved with putting out a newsletter to help animals and animal welfare. So you, I think what I like about doing Boston history is that you find all these threads that lead from one person to another. I mean, I was amazed that Louise May Alcott went out to the fire, you know, and I just stumbled across that in the course of my research. So um, and I see a question. I'm going to jump on this. I think I slipped over. The fire started in this one building and what caused it, we're not certain. It was never really determined, but they think it was in the, there was a furnace in this building. And even though it was banked and the night watchman left, he said everything was ordered, a spark might have somehow gotten from the banked fire and got into the chimney. There was a, there was a kind of a shaft or chimney in the middle of the building and that might've caught fire. And the fire was seen in the basement, but it kind of went whoosh up to the, up to the roof. So it was probably from the, 
some problem with the furnace um, where the fire got caught. Uh, Karen asks, how long did it take to research and write the book? Uh, it took about two years, two, two and a half years, I would say, the whole thing, yeah. Uh, Nancy asked a couple times, uh, would you share with the audience where Trinity yeah. Church was before it moved to Copley Square? Yeah, the whole story of Trinity Church is actually very much, it was on um, Summer Street, um, and it was kind of uh, behind where um, May, in that, that same block where Macy's is, kind of down from a little ways there, I'm trying to, trying to picture it, but it was, um, it was this, um, well, it was, you know, very old church. Um, and actually, at the time of the fire, um, they had the Trinity Church was very, very major thing, but they were already getting ready to move. They already were building the new church in Copley Square. So the Reverend Brooks, who um, uh, was a pastor of that, uh, was very famous theologian at the time and wrote um, A Little Town of Bethlehem. That's his Christmas carol he's known for. Um, he watched it burn. He was there. He tried to rescue things. He watched it burn and he, he talked about it burning she burned magnificently because uh, and even said I, I never really liked that church but I didn't really enjoy seeing her burn either so so there's a lot of little am amusing things that I was able to find a lot of that's in uh, greater detail in that about the uh, book um, I'm just jumping ahead the the modern fire the new fire boat is named for John Damrell it's, it, there is a boat today, and it was named for him because of because of his work. So yeah, um, so uh, the, the fire department, the fire department in Boston, I don't believe they've never really forgotten it. Damrell, they they admired him. They knew he really was doing his best uh, <clears throat> for that for the city at the time. Uh, and he was kind of scapegoated for the fire, but um, but then he became the building inspector. He did not give up the fight. He hung in there and kept going and going to try to make the city a safer place. And Stephanie, there's a, there's a question about uh, Chief Demerol. Um, is Chief Demerol's final resting spot included in your other book, Boston's Fire Trail? Yes, it is. I believe it is. I think we have a, a section on that. I, I'm trying to remember, because that was kind of outside the city. I, I, we mentioned, I think we do, because then we mentioned the fire, firefighters lot in Forest Hills. So I think we do mention it there. A couple more uh, questions here. Um, mm -hmm. Diane asks, even today, the water pipes in Boston were logs. Did this cause a problem in the fire and was water conveyance improved? Yeah, the original water pipes were logs, and then, but by this time they they were they were they had gone to metal or an alloy that were used. I mean, the the whole story of water and water use in Boston is itself a kind of interesting thing because um, originally water was brought in from Jamaica Pond, and then um, then it was from uh, then out to Lake Cotituate, Um, and there were a whole there were a whole series of of developments that created this water flow into the uh, area. And if you're in that, I would recommend going to the um, Waterworks Museum, which is um, right um, in, uh, right across the border from, uh, from Brookline, uh, Chestnut Hill, yeah, I think it's Chestnut Hill anyway, but it's um, right near the, the big reservoir there. And the Waterworks Museum has all that information. In fact, they have an exhibit up on the Great Boston Fire right now. Um, but it, it really tells the story of, of water into Boston. And we don't think about it, but it is, it is such an important part of maintaining um, the health of a city for the water we drink and for the, um, the safety purposes. Because even today, water is the main um, uh, thing that we use to put out fires. I mean, if you watch, I'm sorry, I'm obsessed with the, the um, information from Ukraine, but you can see firefighters going in after the bombing and they're just, they're pouring water on those spots trying to bring them under control. Um, uh, yeah. So, watching, um, yeah. so uh, Stephanie, um, yes. I, I do acknowledge the question in the chat uh, regarding uh, showing of the map. I think in the interest of time, we're going to skip that. But yeah, I, I'm afraid I do so. want to. Yeah, I, exactly. Uh, so, but Carol's question, uh, you mentioned uh, the large number of people viewing yes. the fire. Did this hamper the need to put the fire out and were the police brought in for crowd control? Yes and yes. It was a real major, major problem, uh, the, all these people. And police were brought out and the state militia was also brought out. Um, and, crowd, and, the, and there was a lot of concern about people coming in from New York, for example, just to loot the city um, and they were prevented. But, but there was a real problem because there were people were 
I mean, Daryl later said one of the worst things about this fire were the merchants who started just to give their stuff away because it just created this madhouse of things there. And it was really, really, it made it difficult for the firefighters to get in position, to hook up to, to the water and get water on the fire. Stephanie, the last question goes to Teresa, who wants to know, what is your next project? <laughs> All right. Well, um, a couple things. One, I'm doing an update of my book on the Coconut Grove fire, uh, nightclub fire, which I think a lot of you might be familiar with. I'm trying to, up, I'm, I'm reissuing the book, re-updating that. And then I'm plus I'm working on this really, I'm really excited about this project in which um, there is a diary kept by four women in 1891 on Great Brewster Island. So it's, um, and the Friends of the Boston Harbor Island and um, working with a group there. And we're going to reproduce and publish this diary, which is a snapshot into the lives of women in 19th century in a time when uh, we don't really, we, we know a lot about women and we certainly know a lot about men, but this is a really uh, keen look at the, the lives of uh, four women and uh, what they did on the, and it's a story of the Boston I Harbor Islands too. It's really a great um, tale on both those levels. So I'm working on that. And um, I have a novel that uh, will be published, has been accepted by a publisher and will come out one of these days. Excellent. So uh, Stephanie, we had about a hundred people write positive comments in the chat. So I've saved the oh, chat right. for you and I can email that to you afterwards. Great, thank Stephanie, you. Stephanie, do you have any uh, last words for the audience before we wrap it up? Well, I just want to say thank you very much for, for, for coming to this. Like I said, this is kind of an obscure thing, but I, I think it has a major, it has major lessons for us, not just in Boston, but in all the cities outside. I mean, every city has a fire department. Every city, um, and in many cases, it relies on volunteers. I, I don't know what's happening to us, but a lot of them rely on volunteers. And um, I do try to use the word firefighters. We have both men and women um, in the service right now. Uh, but it is it is an incredibly noble calling. Calling It was then, it still is. And um, I think we have to um, consider um, how we keep our city safe. And um, I'll just say that the scourge of fire is still with us. It's still something we have to worry about, particularly in the wit in the in the forest, um, the areas of the forest where, where we have people in forests trying to live together. So I, I really, really appreciate your interest in this in this topic. So um, I want to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library. I want to thank the libraries in Clinton, Newburyport, Wilmington, North Reading, Andover, Medford, North Andover, Littleton, and Pepperell <laughs> for partnering with Tewksbury for tonight's event. I want to remind folks that you'll be receiving an email from me tomorrow with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, and some additional information about some upcoming virtual programs that may be of interest. Something that Stephanie mentioned is that um, if you uh, are a library that belongs to the Merrimack Valley Library Consortium, uh, I do know for a fact that there were at least five copies of Stephanie's book uh, in the consortium, including one here in Tewksbury. There is a small waiting list, but uh, you know, please I encourage your library to uh, purchase a copy. And even better yet, purchase a copy for yourself and uh, support a, a local independent bookstore if you can. Um, I think that about wraps us up, Stephanie. And I do want to apologize to Stephanie. I have hosted Stephanie five times now, I think, Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie's, really last name, okay. Stephanie's last name is uh, Shoro. Is that correct, yes, Stephanie? that is right. But Not I'm... Shoro, so Shoro. And I, 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 as I was okay. saying it at the beginning, I thought I got that wrong. So uh, I, I do apologize for that. Yeah, so anyway, it's folks, my parents' fault. They gave me this an unpronounceable last name. You know. That's all right. I uh, I should have uh, double checked with you before no we went problem. live. So anyway, thank you all so much for joining us, and uh, look for that email tomorrow. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Thanks again. Great. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good one. So just take me a second. I'm going to save the chat again. Okay. Sorry, it's a little awkward when I uh, don't have my act together here. Okay. All right, now now goodbye for real, Stephanie. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you so much. All right, all right. have a good night. Okay, take care, bye-bye. Bye-bye.